I'm Jonathan Miller, who produced and directed Alice in Wonderland, or at least this production of Alice in Wonderland. It's been filmed many times, uh, and I've never much liked the uh, previous versions, particularly the Disney one, which I thought was absurd. Uh, it's a book which I liked, I think, a lot as a child, though I think, like many children, I was slightly disturbed and disconcerted and even frightened by it when I was young. And I returned to it when I was about 18 or 19 and was struck by the strange melancholy of it and also by, of course, the brilliance with which Lewis Carroll captures the quality of dreaming. And I think by the time I decided to ask whether I could produce the film, I was intrigued by certain aspects of it which I might have got a hint of when I was young, but I couldn't put into words at that time. But by the time I was 18 or 19, I had begun to feel this strange, lingering sadness about the, about the work. And also, as I say, the brilliance with which Lewis Carroll captures the, the peculiar logic of dreaming. When Hollywood films dreams, they tend to be uh, overtly surrealistic based on paintings by Salvador Dali, for example, or long, polished studio floors with smoke pouring along. And it seemed to me that the quality of dream is its curious, uh, it's, it's sort of subliminal oddness. In the middle of the dream, you scarcely notice that it's bizarre. It's only by hindsight that you think how odd to have experienced or thought or visualized all that. What I think finally provoked me into doing it was meeting the playwright Lillian Hellman at a party in New York in, I think, 1962. And we were talking about things that would make good films. And she said, have you ever thought of filming Alice in Wonderland? And it sparked a whole reaction from me. I said, well, the funny thing you should say that. I've always thought what an interesting film it would make if one could rid oneself of the japing fun and games which people have always introduced into the productions. And I think that what I decided to do uh, was very much influenced by my recent reading of uh, an essay by the English literary critic William Empson, who in a book called Some Versions of Pastoral talked about the way in which the writers of the 19th century looked back on childhood as a strange lost period of vision and innocence before, as Wordsworth said, the shades of the prison house began to close around the growing child. Which is why at the beginning of the film, and it's funny, the critics never noticed that they went on about how Freudian the production was, and there's nothing Freudian in it at all, and certainly what didn't occur to me when I was making it. But at the beginning of the film, the voiceover, when you see Alice among the leaves, is, of course, a quotation from Wordsworth's Immortality Ode. There was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth and every common sight to me did seem apparelled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream. And then at the very end, as Alice and her sister leave the scene after Alice has woken up from the dream, is the are the lines from the immortality, oh, the things which I have seen, I now can see no more. And Empson goes on about this in the essay called The Child as Swain in uh, Versions of Pastoral, in which he talks about the uh, Victorian writers who sucked up from childhood a, and used a sort of literary taproot into their memories of childhood, a period of innocence and of vision in which they, or perhaps all of us, saw things in a, a strange luster and in the light of a dream. So that it was that that really preoccupied me when I, uh, when I made the film. Um, and also the strange 
melancholy of the Victorian child, uh, her peculiar solemn propriety. She so often turned into a perky miss, and when I cast it, I was, I was quite determined not to have one of these uh, modern-looking children. I advertised in the newspapers for applicants for the part, uh, and I got about three or four hundred photographs of rather modern-looking girls in, you know, on on holiday with their parents, mucking about in boats, and uh, and they they all looked completely inappropriate to me. And quite suddenly, out of the blue, I got a solemn photograph of this. A uh, girl of about eleven, uh, staring Alice-like out of the photograph, and she was the only person that I actually invited to come and do a camera rehearsal and an audition. So we went out into uh, the field at the back of uh, the um, television centre and shot a bit and brought her in and made her recite some stuff. And I cast her there and then. There was a strange sort of old-fashioned solemnity about her, which seemed to me to be appropriate to the Victorian child. I didn't want a modern child, and I didn't want, as I say, um, these uh, these sort of jollinesses. It had to have that melancholy solemnity and deadpan quality. Um, I think people often commented, they said, why is Alice so serious? Why is it she never smiles? Why is it that she seems so rude to people? And I think that's the way Carol wrote her. I think she was a solemn child. She was, after all, based on the daughter of the Dean of Christ Church in Oxford, Alice Little. And uh, I'm sure that she would have had that dark, pert, know-all quality of the child of a, of an Oxford intellectual. There are certain themes and motifs which become more prominent by hindsight, although I must have put them in quite deliberately. And I think one of them is the strange sense of déjà vu you have, in that when Alice first looks through the tiny door through which she cannot pass in order to get into the garden beyond, it's almost, it is in fact, exactly the same scene that you see much later on when you visit the croquet party. And again, this, these sorts of, uh, I've seen that before, I've felt that before, are things that occur in dreams. And uh, I didn't shoot it in that way with that in mind at the time when I did it. Uh, I think we needed to put a view of a garden down the end of that little framed shot. And we had this bit left over from the croquet party, which we simply vignetted and put in. One of the reasons why, having put it in, I was, I was delighted we had, apart from the fact that there was this déjà vu, is something else which I was reminded of when I was first making the film, and it's connected with the Empson idea of the, the Victorian obsession with the glories of childhood, is another theme which occurs in many children's novels is the the theme and the motif of the secret garden uh, the paradise garden to which you have access as a child and from which you are excluded as a grown-up the little door in the wall H.G. Wells had that wonderful story the little green door in the wall um, the secret garden itself the world of Peter Pan the island to which you cannot go back once you're grown up and I think that that is really one of the things that the uh, that the work is about, is the strange inaccessibility. It's there, of course, in T.S. Eliot's uh, Four Quartets, the transit, the, the, the passage down which you cannot go now, but once led you to this world of uh, enchantment and innocence and vision from which you are excluded as an adult because you're too large to get in through the entrance. 
I go to date. Yes, yes, yes. I shall proceed. Yes, yes, yes. Edwin and Morka, the earls of Mercia and Northumbria, soon declared for him. And even Stigand, as the patriotic Archbishop of Canterbury, found it advisable to go with Edgar Aethling and Arthur William the Crown. While the country still reeled under the shock... I knew that when I was going to make the film that I had to make concessions to uh, showbiz. And uh, in order to justify even that modest expense of £32,000 or wherever it was in, uh, finally, uh, we would have to have stars. Um, but I wanted uh, stars who could play these particular characters without joking them up too much and making them seem to be Victorian. And uh, I uh, took my courage in both hands and started to ask rather famous actors um, if they would do it for as little as 500 pounds uh, for, uh, for their performance. And uh, I asked John Gilgood, I had worked with him once before, about, I think, seven or eight years earlier, where he'd played Chekhov for me in a memoir of Chekhov. Um, and we knew each other anyway because we were in the theater. But, uh, you know, again, he was a young man. I was only in my early 30s, uh, bravely approaching these big stars. And Gilgood agreed. And then I thought, well, I, I'll, tr I'll try some more of this. And then I went to Michael Redgrave and said, I would like you to play the caterpillar. And he, I think, said, oh, well, I don't want to appear in a caterpillar costume, whatever that looks like. And I said, no, you won't. You'll just be in the Sir John Soane Museum dusting down one of Soane's architectural models. And he said, right. So we had him. And then it seemed to me that Malcolm Muggeridge was a perfect person to play the griffin. Um, I like this rather grand, gravelly voice. And he instantly leapt at the part and said, yes, of course I'll do it. Uh, McKern, I told him I'd, I'd like you to play the ugly duchess, and he never gave it a second thought. He said, of course, that'll be wonderful. How wonderful to play a drag part, having previously cast him uh, as Socrates in the, uh, in the drinking party. So I think I'm the only person who managed to take a great actor like Leo McKern and stretch him in the course of less than five years between a drag role and the greatest uh, European philosopher. Um, Peter Cook agreed to play uh, the Mad Hatter and uh, Alan Bennett agreed to play the mouse who did the dry historical tale. That seemed perfect because was, Alan was at that time still doing his postgraduate work in history. Even though we'd finished Beyond the Fringe, he was still working on uh, archives of the court of Richard II. And so it seemed to me it was perfect to have um, um, Alan's dry academic manner uh, committed to this part. Um, Mick Goff played the uh, the March Hare. And then I think what was most wonderful was uh, this extraordinary figure, Wilfred Lawson, famously drunken figure who would sit uh, drinking boilermakers in, uh, in, in pubs in St. Martin's Lane. With a wonderful voice like that. And, uh, and I said, would you play the doormat? Oh, yes, that would be rather fascinating. I won't have to wear an animal head but I, because I won't be able to drink. And I said, no, no, you'll be able to, to drink. And he said, oh, well, that should be fun. I think I'll do that. And um, he came along and, and gave a masterly version of the doormat. And again, I, I didn't have to have him pretending to be an animal. I just wanted a dozing drunken figure sitting at this breakfast table and waking up every now and then and telling Alice that there were these sis these little sisters who lived down the well. And, it, and she said, what sort of well? And he said, a treacle well. And she said, what did they live on? Treacle. And, she, and then he, she said, 
And these, these are the lines that Carol wrote, but he gave them such a wonderful inflection. She said, well, w w what did they live on? Mm -hmm. Treacle. She said they would have been ill. Mm -hmm. They were very, very ill. <laughs> So he was heavenly to work with. That was an enchanted summer day, actually. That at Rousham Park, we laid, or Julia laid, this wonderful Victorian tea table. And we sat all day and shot in this marvelous insect-infested garden, surrounded by the buzzing of the bees. And actually, we used to, in order to increase the buzzing, Julia would go and collect a cigar box filled with insects, which we would then hold near to the microphone so that you hear all this... And that leads me to, of course, the choice of the music. That long, somnolent, hot summer day of childhood, when summers and days seem to go on forever, seemed to me to be typified by the sounds of insects and also, of course, by those strange insect-like sounds of the plucked strings of the sitar, which somehow become uh, part of the, uh, uh, of the music of the insects. And uh, so I, I approached Ravi Shankar and asked him whether he would uh, write and play the music on the sitar. My other reason for choosing him was that I thought, well, here is this work written in the late 1860s, at the height of the empire, when uh, the uh, Alice as a child would have leafed through the pages of the illustrated London News and seen engravings of photographs of Durbar's, and when Queen Victoria was the Empress of India. And on this hot summer day, somehow there were strange feelings of of that Indian world. Now, of course, one thing I must talk about is the absence of animal heads. As soon as anyone hears about Alice in Wonderland, they think they're going to see playing cards and uh, frogs and, um, and caterpillars and so forth. And, and you then employ very expensive, famous actors and <laughs> disguise them, which seems to me to be totally absurd. And in any case, I think that when you read the, the book carefully and you think about Lewis Carroll, this strange bachelor uh, academic in Oxford, you realize that this, of course, is a portrait of the, an academic uh, Oxford world in which all of these people are people that these, this young child would have known as she walked across the various quadrangles in the colleges at Oxford. And uh, so college servants, cooks and footmen and dons and professors and clergymen. And I think that this is what Carol had in mind when he told his story to Alice on that long sunlit afternoon. I'm sure that what he was doing was talking about the people that Alice as a child knew. He gave them animal names and people have taken that literally in the past. And the only way in which it's successfully represented with those animal heads is, of course, in Tenniel's masterly drawings. But that's because uh, engravings and drawings um, are perfectly uh, natural for that idiom. But as soon as you have real people, you want to have real people. And if you have huge animal heads on, on their shoulders, uh, you can't see who they are. Imagine covering up Malcolm Muggeridge uh, with, a, uh, you know, with a griffin's head whatever a griffin's head looks like. Come back. I have something important to say. Yes? Keep your temper. Is that all? No.
I think one of the great delights of Carol's work is to do with an overlooked and certainly uh, neglected aspect of his own uh, serious work as a mathematician. Um, I think Queen Victoria once asked him what he was going to be publishing next, and he said that it was a textbook of symbolic logic. You know, it's, it's often forgotten that uh, uh, Lewis Carroll made a substantial contribution to a serious area of academic discipline, to symbolic logic. And in fact, certainly in the Sorbonne, his textbook of symbolic logic was uh, standard reading amongst uh, students of mathematics and symbolic logic until the middle of the 20th century. So he was very deeply concerned with the structures of language and the meaning of meaning and the way in which words had these curiously different meanings. And uh, there are wonderfully interesting uh, humors and humorous games are played with uh, uh, with meanings and with uh, with logic. Um, riddles, of course, which have unexpected solutions, uh, in a way that logic itself has unexpected solutions. Uh, his mind was very mathematical, and also he was very much concerned with the structure of sentences. We can see in Lewis Carroll antecedents of what later became in the 20th century uh, uh, the, the um, examination of syntax and semantics in what is now called psycholinguistics. I think he would have been an enthusiastic sponsor of the of 20th century psycholinguistics. And we see antecedents of many of the serious uh, trends in in academic linguistics in his work, but he dealt with it with such lightness of touch. And one or two of the cast managed to improvise in the style of this. I didn't encourage people to say many things that weren't actually in the text, and I certainly wrote nothing myself. But John Bird came up with the most inspired episode during the scene uh, with Alice when he's playing the frog footman. And there's a wonderful moment, which is pure Carol, and of course, pure uh, logic game. When Alice, having thundered uh, to no effect on the door of the of the Pepper Cook's kitchen, he says, "He says, what shall I do?" And he and then Bird came up with this extraordinary piece of improvisation. It came completely off the top of his head. He said, "I'll tell you what I'll do for you. Uh, I'll tell you what I'll do for you." Nothing. He said, how would that be? Uh, uh, nothing. I said, of course, I, 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 I couldn't do it straight away because uh, I've got all these things cropping up. As you see, just somebody cropped up just then, and indeed the fish footman had just come into the room. He said, so if I was to do nothing for you, and I can't promise I can, but if I was to do nothing for you, I'd have to find the time, see, when I could squeeze it in. Well, now, I think Carol would have been enchanted by that. Yes. Now then, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you what I'll do for you. Nothing. How's that? Any good to you at all? Nothing? I mean, I won't be able to do it straight away. I'll, I'll say that, you see. I couldn't, couldn't possibly do it straight away because I've got all these things cropping up, you see, I have to deal with. I Well, I mean, you saw just now something cropped up there, you see, and I'll get that's the same type of thing I get cropping up all the time, you see. So, naturally, I've got my hands full, but uh, if I was to do nothing for you, which I can't promise I could, but if I was to do nothing for you, I'd... I'd have to sort of find a time, you see, when I could squeeze it in. You see what I mean? I think you're absolutely idiotic. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. And Sellers himself, uh, he's someone I forgot, of course. <laughs> uh, um, I cast Peter Sellers with a great deal of uh, foreboding because I knew that he was quite difficult to pin down. And Sellers agreed to play the the King of Hearts, with Alison Leggett, marvellous actress who had been a lot at the Royal Court, with whom I had acted uh, myself in the only part I'd ever played on the stage. So Alison played the Queen of Hearts and Sellers played the King of Hearts. During the trial, 
Sellers once again came up, as Bird had done, with the most brilliant piece of improvisation. There's a wonderful moment when another actor I've forgotten, and that was Wilfred Bramble, who played the White Rabbit. And uh, Bramble says, uh, this letter's just been picked up. He played him fantastically camp. And um, the foreman of the jury said, uh, uh, who, who's, it, who's it to? Uh, it's not to anyone, says the White Rabbit, as indeed he did in the book. And then Sellers suddenly chimed in and said, well, then, oh, dear, well, it's, uh, it's got to be written to somebody. I mean, you, you've got to write to somebody. I mean, if everyone wrote to nobody all the time, well, I mean, well, the, post, the post office would come to a standstill. To my boy and beat him when he sleeps. For he can suddenly enjoy the temper when he sleeps. I speak severely to my boy. I beat him when he sneezes, for he could thoroughly enjoy the pepper if he pleases. I was working at the BBC at the time when I thought of doing Alice in Wonderland. I had been under contract in the previous two or three years. Two years earlier, I had been the producer and presenter of the BBC arts program Monitor, which I inherited from Hugh Weldon, who had pioneered this arts program. And for a year, I uh, presented and produced Monitor, not with great success, but I think quite interestingly, I had to get away from some of the styles which had uh, emerged uh, in the late 50s. And uh, I introduced all sorts of people who uh, wouldn't normally have appeared on an arts program. We interviewed people like Susan Sontag, for example, and we had interviews with art historians. Up to that time, there had been a, a sequence of, uh, as it were, literary and artistic big game that uh, Hugh Weldon used to go out and hunt, and he was always very impressed by very important people like Henry Moore, I mean, I, I, I once did a pastiche of him saying, um, we've just uh, monitor uh, this week uh, consists of interview and uh, a visit to so-and-so and so-and-so who uh, works in stone, in metal, and in clay, in natural materials. And we visited him in his farmhouse in Brittany where he lives with his wife, four children, and ten dogs, and we liked him, and we think you will too. And uh, I, uh, much to uh, the uh, dismay of the English critics at that time, started introducing uh, all sorts of odd Americans like Andy Warhol and Susan Sontag. I remember that uh, Bernard Levin came down on me like an ounce of bricks for having this interview with Susan Sontag. And here she is, one of the most famous writers in the world now. Um, and then I, uh, the, they terminated the program uh, after a year, and uh, I felt rather guilty at having uh, as it were, inflicted this fatal blow on a, what had become a famous institution in the, uh, uh, in the media uh, treatment of the arts. And then I made uh, a couple of films. I did a film of uh, Plato's Symposium, which was retitled The Drinking Party, with Leo McKern and uh, Roddy Maud Roxby and Alan Bennett and John Fortune. And then I did The Death of Socrates. And then I did a film with Michael Horden of Whistle and I'll Come to You. Um, the ghost story, and then I, emboldened by the modest success of these programs, I went to Hugh Weldon and said, um, I would really quite like to do a film of Alice in Wonderland, which I had costed roughly 
And uh, Weldon said to me, um, how much do you think it'll cost? And I said, well, uh, roughly speaking, above the line, about, and you remember, this is nearly 40 years ago, I said, it, uh, it'll cost about 28,000 pounds. He said, oh, no, no, it won't. It will cost you 32,000 pounds, and I suggest you go ahead and make it. But of course, <laughs> this is a bygone age. Uh, now, a project of this sort lies on what is loosely called a commissioning editor's uh, desk for about two years and then gets turned down. But uh, eight weeks after I had uh, suggested it to Hugh, we were looking for locations, and uh, a month later we were making the film. Your watch tell you what year it is? Of course not. That's because it's the same year for so long together. Exactly! Well, it's just the same with my watch. Oh, when Adam and Eve were first deprived of the garden hard by him. Oh, the dormouse has fallen asleep again. Have you guessed the riddle yet? No, I give up. What is the answer? I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> well, I think you might do something better with your time than waste it. I knew from the very beginning that there was no way in which I could compete with the masterly graphic style of Tenniel. It was made for the printed page. The character of engraving is consistent with typography. Um, engraving and type belong together on paper. And as soon as you introduce photography, you have to make a decision which is completely different. And I knew that I had to, or wanted to, make the thing look like uh, the Victorian world which Carol and his contemporaries inhabited. And it was... Uh, it seemed perfectly obvious to me that what we had to do was to create a photographic world, which is why we shot it in black and white, a photographic world which was like the photographs that Carroll himself had, uh, had made. Another thing that's forgotten, of course, is that Carroll himself was a great amateur photographer. Um, and, of course, almost at the same time, the... Uh, the great English uh, woman photographer, Julia Margaret Cameron, was pioneering uh, portraits. So that when Dick Bush and I spoke about the visual style, I said, I want it lit in such a way that it is consistent with the, uh, with the late daguerreotypes of the 1850s and the early... Uh, the early photography of people like uh, Julia Margaret Cameron and even uh, Fox Talbot and Carroll himself. So we looked very carefully at these photographs and looked at the way in which the light fell. And it, we, we saw that it had to be very diffuse and that it didn't have to be, it, 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 it didn't have to be lit harshly with cinematic lights. And Dick, I think, took enormous pleasure in reproducing the tone of uh, of both Carol's and uh, Julia Cameron, and also I think Roger Fenton as well we looked at. I was looking recently at the exhibition of Julia Margaret Cameron's illustrations to, uh, to Tennyson, which of course again is at the same period, and you'll see these, these girls <clears throat> photographed against ivy-clad brick walls. And I was astounded by hindsight to see how carefully and how closely and how lovingly Dick Bush had managed to reproduce that photographic world of the mid-19th century. We decided very early on that we would shoot it on a fairly wide-angle lens so that we had deep focus. Now, this, of course, is slightly inconsistent with the, uh, with the Victorian photographs. They couldn't get such deep focus because their films were too slow. You look at Julia Margaret Cameron's photographs today, and you can see that they really don't have very deep focus. Uh, often things in the background appear very blurred and things in the foreground. It's only in the middle field that you get sharp focus. Um, but nevertheless, I, there was something, there's something about also the wide-angle lens. In addition to the fact that you could keep things in focus from front to back, there's also a strange, uncanny feeling of uh, a sort of preternatural, almost surrealist vividness which often 
is the characteristic of dreams. So we shot practically everything on a 9mm lens. It also allowed people to come close and get very distorted and then rapidly disappear or rapidly change their proportions as the camera pulled back from them. There's a very rapid change in the proportions of a face which is seen first of all in close-up on a, on a wide-angle lens and then when the camera pulls back the normal proportions of the face are suddenly restored. So that when Alice, for example, changes her size, I started her uh, looking with her mouth filled with the biscuits that have been thrown into the, uh, into the little house. And I had her right close up to the camera, uh, distorted to the point of ugliness, and then had her pull away suddenly. And she suddenly altered her proportions, and you suddenly realized she'd got smaller. That meant that we didn't have to use any trick photography in order to get changes of size. I hate it when um, visible technical uh, skill is used in order to produce uh, these magical changes. Often it was done just simply by altering the size of the furniture or altering the angle from which they were shot. Then they learned to draw. And they always drew something beginning with an M. Why an M? Mm, why not? <laughs> Everything beginning with an M, such as mousetrap, money, memory, and muchness. I bet you never saw anything like the draw. I was determined to do most of the scenes in realistic settings, uh, with the exception of the uh, trial scene at the end, which was made and built uh, at Ealing Studios, which was then the film studios of the BBC, almost everything was shot on location. And for a month or even six weeks, I toured all over England, having advertised for various things, um, and taken advice from people who said, you might see this, you might see that, let me see, let me go through the, the, various, the various locations. The scene where Alice fell asleep was with her sister in that riverside a meadow, was shot at a place called Rousham Park near, near Oxford, where I also shot the, um, uh, the tea party with the Mad Hatter and the March Hare and the Dormouse. I was eager to find something which would be the equivalent of the Pool of Tears. There was no way in which I was going to flood a, a studio at the BBC, and I wanted something which was more metaphorical than that. And I, I've forgotten how I found it, but I think, it, again, I advertised for um, a swimming bath and I think I first visited the drained swimming bath of a local lunatic asylum where my father had worked as a psychiatrist during the Second World War. Um, and I went and visited this drained and dusty uh, swimming bath, but it, it seemed too commonplace. And then someone wrote to me and said, there is, in fact, an, and you won't believe this, um, a small swimming pool under the floorboards of a house in, I think it's in, where, where is it? Oh, at Donington Castle, in Castle Donington. Um, I think it had been previously owned by an invalid proprietor who wanted to dip himself into a healing pool um, within easy reach of his own bedroom. And we went to this place in Castle Donington, and there, believe it or not, was in fact, uh, under the floorboards, under a trap door, there was this very small swimming bath with no more than about eight inches of headroom between the floorboards and the top of the pool, into which this man dipped himself uh, in order to have some sort of restorative experience. 
and uh, the pool of tears I I had uh, in this, and it was just glimpsed by Alice. You heard her sobbing, and then looking down, she would see beneath the floorboards these flooded, inundated, drenched creatures swimming, uh, and then she disappeared. So that took place at Donington Castle, and the caucus race was also done in the abandoned uh, ruined chapel at Donington Castle. And where else did we go? Oh, the scene as she went down the rabbit hole. I didn't want all that tumbling down a, a rabbit hole. It seemed to me to be rather boring. And again, as in dreams, you say, I'm going down a rabbit hole, and then I found myself somewhere else. That's what happens in dreams. You, uh, you find yourself somewhere else. And my father, who had worked in the First World War as a, uh, a rookie psychiatrist, military psychiatrist, told me that there was this ruined military mental hospital down on Southampton Water at Netley. And we visited Netley, and there were these long, dusty, empty corridors with broken glass. And uh, this seemed to me to be perfect. We'd actually have Alice disappear through a... Uh, a stone archway crawling through this darkness. And then instead of tumbling, I had her, as often happens in dreams, I was, as one says to oneself, I was, I seem to remember in my dream, I was crawling through a tunnel and then found myself running along a corridor with curtains drifting in the wind. And Julia Trevelyan Oman, who designed the, uh, the sets and the various dressings of these locations, hung these gauze curtains down this half-mile-long corridor at Netley Hospital, and the wind blew in from Southampton Water, and uh, you could see the curtains all the way along. And that was all shot there at Netley. The croquet match was done at a country house down in Surrey, whose name I've forgotten now, and it was a very large, grand, Edwardian country house with a stream running through it. And uh, we shot mm, the croquet match there and all the scenes around the croquet match and also the scene with the ugly duchess walking down the, uh, the lane of trees. But as I say, the most elaborate set, and this was deliberately made and constructed quite expensively by Julia Trevelyan Oman, was the trial scene. And there, I wanted something which, again, as happens in dreams, now a child like Alice would never have been in a law court. Um, but what would she have been in? Well, of course, as the child of the Dean of Christ Church, she would have been in the college chapel, and she would have been in hotels down at the seaside. And so I filled this chapel-like interior with galleried rooms in which people were getting dressed and having breakfast. And again, that always happens in dreams. You say to yourself, hey, it seems rather odd now, but it didn't seem odd at the time. I was in this college chapel and people were getting dressed and having breakfast. And it was very brilliantly designed by, by Julia. The scene with the caterpillar was done in a museum which I had always adored. And one was the breakfast room at the Sir John Soane Museum in Lincoln's Inn Fields. And then someone told us there was a marvellous Victorian kitchen downstairs. And indeed there was, with a great black-leaded stove. And we decided to do the pepper cook's kitchen down there, with uh, Avril Elgar playing the pepper cook and uh, Leo McKern as the ugly duchess nursing this pig baby. <laughs> I think Alice in Wonderland, like so many of the novels of the 19th century, whether written for children or for adults, of course are pictures of a vanished world before the uh, egalitarianism of the 20th century overtook uh, the, uh, the social arrangements. It's a world in which uh, 
servants are subservient. It's a world in which um, academics led celibate lives in Oxford. They weren't allowed to marry. There was a strange sort of decorum. Children were said to be seen and not heard, which is one of the reasons why, in fact, I very rarely allow Alice to speak by moving her lips. She thinks out loud, but doesn't speak out loud. And uh, she has her hair um, carefully and uh, almost servilely combed for her by these, uh, these dwarf-like women, who I based, in fact, on uh, Velasquez Las Maninas. But it is um, a social world which has vanished, people stooping and bowing as the Queen passes by, and a world, in fact, of Queen Victoria. And I think Alison played, Alison Leggett played the Queen very much as if she were Queen Victoria, with this slightly idiotic son who's always <laughs> um, <laughs> singing God Save Our Queen while going w w with his finger. <laughs> And so there are overtones of Osborne and of Queen Victoria's court and a world of servants and croquet matches and military processions and liveried servants. How are you getting on? I don't think they play at all fairly. How do you like the Queen? Not at all. Who are you talking to? It's a friend of mine. I don't like the look of it at all. A cat may look at a queen. Okay, cats are allowed to do that. <laughs> it must be removed. Executioner, about that cat. I want his head taken off. Right off. Yeah. Well, you've got a problem there, haven't you? I mean, with regard to cutting off a head, you've got a real problem, and this is a body to cut it off from. I mean, you see what I mean? Don't talk nonsense. Anything that has a head can be beheaded. <laughs> anyway, who does it belong to? It belongs to the Duchess, and you'd better ask her about it. <laughs> I wanted to shoot the long conversation between the ugly duchess and Alice after she's been relieved of her uh, flamingo from the croquet match, where the ugly duchess suddenly jumps out from behind a tree and uh, walks her along this avenue of trees. And we first of all thought that it might be interesting to do a long tracking shot and lay rails but Dick Bush, this wonderful cameraman who shot Alice, said, I think I can do this all handheld. And I said, well, you can't possibly do a thing which will last about six minutes handheld. He said, well, let's give it a whirl. So he put the camera on his shoulder. I then held him round the waist. Around my waist was the, uh, the focus puller. And behind that was the sound man. And we... This, this snaking procession walking backwards in front of Alice and uh, the Ugly Duchess, played by Leo McKern, proceeded with me speaking Alice's words because I wanted her speaking to be a voiceover. Because, of course, in a dream you often don't... You hear yourself speaking, but don't necessarily open your mouth to do so because you're thinking out loud, which is what happens in dreams. And, uh, and Dick took us on the most perilous, circuitous route while walking backwards. He went round the trees, and this peculiar vision, which I wish we had filmed, of five people walking backwards with one person speaking Alice's lines so that Leo McKern would have his cues correctly, snaked their way nearly uh, a quarter of a mile down this avenue of trees. And that was all shot in this, uh, in this country house down in Surrey, whose name I forget at the moment. Say much better than that, if I choose. Please don't trouble yourself to sit any longer than that. Don't talk about trouble. I make you a present of everything I've said as yet. Cheap sort of present, I must say. Thinking again? I have a right to think. 
about as much right as pigs have to fly. And the moral... Uh, Either you or your head must be off in the next five minutes. Take your choice. <laughs> She'll be the death of me. Come on, let's get on with the game. <laughs> Here we are. What's happened to them? They're going to be executed. What do you mean? They're going to have their heads taken off. What, all of them? Yes, the whole lot. There's no point spoiling the ship for a hate of the tar. Have you seen the mock turtle? No, who's that? Well, you better ask the griffin about that. He'll be able to let you know. That's just her fantasy. She never executes anyone. Ah, oh, there he is. What's he so sad about? That's just his fantasy. He's got nothing to be sad about, really. This young lady wants to hear your life history. All right. I'll tell it to her. And don't speak a word till I finish. I suppose, technically speaking, uh, I should have cast it with what is supposed to have been a seven-year-old child. Um, now, there were two main reasons why uh, I cast it in the way that I did. One was that I was slightly frightened of finding a seven-year-old child who could play it in the way that I wanted. And the other thing was that any, all, any competitors were supplanted by this young lady who, whose mother sent in this photograph. She happened to be 11 rather than 7, and uh, it seemed to me that she was perfect for the part. Also, I think by hindsight, I can see now that since I was interested in the idea of a child who knew, as she says at the end of the film, the things that I have seen, I now can see no more, that it is about growing up. This is a child poised on the edge of, of what they wouldn't have called, but we call now teenage, um, who now foresees her forthcoming role as a woman. I could imagine doing it with a seven-year-old child, and I think it would be much easier to cast a seven-year-old child now. There are lots and lots of young people who actually act a great deal. You see things like Grange Hill and so forth, and you know that there are young people who can perform very well. But it so happened that this rather remarkable young woman turned up unsolicited and seemed to me to be perfect. I loved her strange, uh, joke-proof solemnity. That was with the drawling master. He used to come once a week. He taught us drawling, stretching, and fainting in coil. What was that like? I couldn't possibly show you myself. I'm much too stiff. And he never learnt it. Never had time. But I went to the classical master. Mm, I never went to him. He taught laughing and grief, or so they said. So he did. So he did. How many hours a day did you do lessons? Ten hours the first day. Nine seconds. And so on. How odd. Not odd at all. That's why they're called lessons, because they lessen from day to day. This sequence was shot at Pegwell Bay. I had seen a wonderful picture by William Dicey called Oyster Catchers at Pegwell Bay. And we shot that uh, on, on the beach at Pegwell Bay. We started under the cliffs, and then 
quite spontaneously, uh, Gilgood and Muggeridge said, well, why don't we do this dance? And these old men went out with their bare feet out onto the wet, low tide sand and did this wonderful dance quite spontaneously. It simply happened without any planning. And it was remarkable, I think. It must be a very pretty dance. I knew when I started compiling the script, though in fact we never actually published or distributed a script when we started shooting, but when I started thinking about the, the shooting schedule, uh, I knew that I didn't have to write a script. All I had to do was to copy out the words that Carol had written for the various characters. I made no adaptations, really. There were one or two sequences which I suppose are slightly different from the original, but I wanted to reproduce the sequence as it occurred in the book and most of the words that are given to the characters in the book. There are one or two extra lines which I allowed characters or the actors uh, to improvise because they actually did something rather wonderful with them. But I never wrote those lines. Most of the character, most of the lines which are not carols are lines that were improvised on the spot. Uh, Peter Cook, for example, um, uh, intri he began singing uh, at one point, when Adam and Eve were first deprived of the garden, heard by heaven, an idle thing just thrown in. Uh, Sellers suddenly improvising uh, that uh, little sequence about uh, it being impossible to write to nobody. John Bird improvising that sequence about offering Alice a service of nothing. Um, all of these seemed consistent with what Carol had written. They were logic jokes. Um, but I, I didn't write anything at all. All that I did was to, um, I think we just typed out the, the dialogue and handed it to the actors that, that morning who just memorized them and then and then played them. Uh, I, I never distributed a bound script. I don't think I handed a script to anyone when I asked them to play the parts. I said, would you play the Dormouse? Would you play this, that, or the other? And they said, well, just give me the words and I'll, I'll, I'll mug it up half an hour before we do it. And then I, as I said, in some of the cases, I allowed the, the, the performers um, to, to improvise certain bits. Um, the strange thing is that because uh, I was associated with the satirical movement, which was uh, beyond the fringe, um, people assumed that when I approached this film, I would modernize it in some way, and that, it, of course, it would be Freudian. Uh, that's mainly because Freud is the only name that most journalists would associate with psychiatry or with psychology and or therefore with modernism, so that people endlessly looked for and claimed to identify Freudian sexual symbols in the, uh, in the production. But there's nothing Freudian about it. I wasn't interested in Freud at all. I was interested in Wordsworth, and I was interested in the world that Empson had spoken about in the uh, uh, versions of Pastoral, a world in which the child was seen as blessed and a world in which growing up was seen as a catastrophe. One of the things I was thinking about a great deal when I directed the film was something which was common to both uh, Looking Glass and Wonderland, in that the progress of the child through both of the books is towards growing up. In... Uh, Looking Glass, she makes her progress across the chessboard and yearns to become a queen, in other words, to become grown up. In Wonderland, she makes her way across this disheveled dreamscape, and what happens at the end? She is accused of being two miles high and finds herself being accused. In other words, she's reached her legal majority. And I think in both cases, what Alice is, what Carol is talking about, as so many Victorians were talking about, was the strange, melancholy catastrophe of reaching adult life. Everyone around Alice is hastening and harried and and uh, 
uh, and, and hurried and forlorn. And the, the, the griffin and the mock turtle can reminisce about their school days, which seemed enchanting. And there were these long, interminable, hot summers before the world fell to bits. I beg your pardon, Your Majesty, for bringing these along, but uh, I haven't quite finished my tea. Looking backwards at any work that one does at a distance of uh, almost 40 years, uh, you invariably see things which are now fixed permanently on the celluloid. You think, oh, why did I do that? I wish I could have slightly pulled back, made that less immediately jocular. There are little bits and pieces. I wish Peter Cook, for example, hadn't done that pratfall at the party and seemed to slip off his chair. Um, that was my fault. I should have got him. I should have simply reshot the scene and asked him not to do that. Um, but we were. One of the things I remember was that we were working under very, very um, tight shooting schedule. Uh, we didn't have a large budget. We didn't have an enormous amount of time to redo scenes. Often, I'd, I there were there were shot one offs and that was it. And then we had to pack up and go. But there are little bits and pieces. There's a scene in the trial when Peter Sellers, I think, so um, uh, put out by the humor of uh, Peter Cook's forward and backward arrival, was determined to get his comic bit of business in and reached out for him and fell off the uh, pedestal. And I wish he hadn't done that. But Sellers was only giving us about three or four hours of his time, and I simply couldn't go back and reshoot it. So there are little odd bits and pieces which I think were trying to be too funny for words, and I uh, would like to have gone back. There are one or two things which I think I did to the soundtrack in the trial scene. I kept on thinking how nice it would be to have sort of faint animal noises in the back, grunts and hens clucking. And I think if I'd had a chance to redo the soundtrack, I'd have diminished those. But there they are. They're there for all time. That's what happens with film. Um... Otherwise, most of it, I look back now, it, it produces a, a sense of melancholy satisfaction. I feel that, yes, it's a picture of my own long, sunlit childhood days, though, of course, more than a hundred years later. But my childhood was spent in those long, hot summers of the Second World War out in the country. And I think there are there are bits of it which are reminiscences of my own childhood in that way. I think most of the film I'm rather I'm rather happy with. It's it seems rather uh, a satisfactory work, uh, and uh, it grows on me. I've seen it many times. Often I've gone uh, fifteen years without looking at it, and uh, now looking at it again, I think well that really is rather good. It's I like its melancholy and I like its melancholy humour the little words that get thrown in by actors, little things that Sellers did. Sellers was awfully difficult to work with. He would often arrive. I say often. He didn't arrive very much anyway. Uh, we, we got him onto the locations, I think, no more than about three times. And he would often arrive in a state of peculiar, uh, superstitious gloom. He was um, he was a very superstitious man, endlessly reading... Uh, you know, astrology, and was worried if black cats had crossed his path on the way to the location, and would sometimes sit in a, uh, sit in a state of impenetrable uh, gloom and not prepared to go on. And I once had to employ that little tiny band that we have in the uh, in the croquet match to serenade him back into a good mood. Considering the number of big stars that we have in this production, it's really astounding that it was so frictionless. Uh, and the uh, the actors were so cooperative and amiable, and I think they were rather enchanted by the by the by the circumstances, by this strange caravan of filmmakers out in the summer countryside, perhaps reminiscing themselves about their own childhoods. Um, I don't think there were any real frictions, nor were there any things that could be called 
you know, lovey egos at all. The only difficulty was uh, Seller's gloom and uh, his superstition, which would sometimes made it difficult to get him onto the set. It wasn't that he was having a tantrum or he was being grand. It was the, the very opposite. He was just in a state of uh, superstitious gloom because um, his uh, his astrologer had given him bad news that morning. Um, uh, Gilgood was enchanting. Uh, Muggeridge was delightful. Alison Leggett, who I'd always greatly admired, who was in fact the aunt of a friend of mine from Cambridge. Uh, Wilfred Bramble was an, was enchanting. I think he was delighted after playing this toothless old father in Steptoe and Son to suddenly have the opportunity of playing this rather gay figure. Um, and I, he, I think one of the lines he liked best of all was uh, turning around and uh, said, what's written on it? There's nothing written on it. That's the queerest thing about it. Nearly <laughs> two miles high. Consider your silences. Your reverses. No, 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 no. There's more evidence to come yet. This paper's just been picked up. What's in it? I haven't opened it yet. But it seems to be a letter written by the prisoner to somebody. Uh, it, it must be that. I, mean, I think the reaction at the BBC was fairly guarded. Um, when I showed the first rough cut to Hugh Weldon. He was he sat in a very small, darkened viewing theatre in Ealing, and uh, the lights came up, and there was a silence, and I said, uh, how did you like it? And he said, um, ma magisterial. And I said, well, it's a bit too long. Oh, he says, no, 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 it's not a bit too long. It's, um, it's disastrously too long. And he made me cut it by about um, half an hour, if not more. I had very much longer, languorous midsummer sequences. And I now regret not having resisted. Uh, I think it would, it, it would, the, the, the longers to me were part of the tone of the work, those interminable, hot summer days of childhood where the days seem to go on forever is part of what I was trying to do. But um, Hugh said, no, 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 you must, you must. It's disastrously too long. Um, then a number of interesting things happened. I had to go away to produce a play or direct a play in the United States. So I had to leave it in the hands of the BBC publicity department to deal with the opening. I wasn't in England for the, uh, for the press showing, for example. And I had talked to Hugh Weldon about how I wanted it uh, put in, in, the, in the schedule. I said to him, look, I, I, um, although I'd love children to see it, um, I really think it's, I've made it for adults um, who remember their childhoods. So I'd like it to be shown in the evening so that it's not just thrown away as a sort of entertaining children's program. Well, as you might expect, the press got hold of the wrong end of the stick. They said, oh, uh, trendy Jonathan Miller thinks it's for adults only. It's obviously a sexually violent um, and abusive... Uh, they didn't yet know the word paedophiliac, um, but I think some of them might have told them that Lewis Carroll had this had this reputation for himself for being paedophiliac with his photographs. But anyway, they got hold of the wrong end of the stick, and there were questions asked in Parliament. Um, you know, can uh, Dr. Miller explain uh, why it is that uh, this masterly novel for children is now being shown for adults only, as if it was in a pornographic shop in Soho? And why is the taxpayer paying license fees for the uh, the corruption of a great children's classic? Well, by the time I got back, the shit had hit the fan all about that. And, of course, uh, characteristically, the press had misunderstood it. I had simply asked Hugh to show it at night so that adults would see it as well. But as soon as you use the word adult, uh, it's associated with, uh, you know, with pornography and child abuse. 
and the press wrote about it and as if in fact it was a a Freudian uh, piece of uh, sexual innuendo. I can't see how you could possibly see it in the production. But uh, the funny thing about uh, journalists, particularly the tabloid press, is that when they're out to get you, they'll do anything they can to get you. Now, I think my memories of the actual filming are of an enchanted summer. And I often talk to my wife when the weather goes in a certain way. I say, oh, gosh, this is Alice weather. And I look back to that enchanted six or seven weeks out in the English countryside as being one of the happiest times of my life. <laughs> 